Better? All right. So um, this talk is about uh, partial order reduction and uh, theoretical analysis of partial order reduction techniques that have been proposed in uh, planning on one hand and in computer edit verification on the other. To use a mic, or no? Okay. I've always wanted to use one. So this talk is uh, quite related to uh, Martin and Martha's talk. Um, actually, it would be interesting to explore some of the relationship later. Um, it's about pruning methods, but specifically for optimal delete-free planning, and we're going to use very strongly the properties of uh, delete-free problems. It joint work with Avitan Geffen, my PhD student, or rather it's mostly his work. So why pruning? Well, I guess it's obvious, but let me just read the slide. So we know that heuristic methods, heuristic search is a method of choice for solving uh, planning problems, and that we've got really good relaxation-based method to generate heuristics, but we also know that they're, they're not good enough, that even if we get good heuristic estimates, then we're not guaranteed to uh, be able to solve efficiently some hard problems. So we need to look at additional methods, and pruning methods are, are one option, and also decomposition methods are another option, and there are other ideas, and in this talk, we're focusing on pruning methods, but also decomposition plays a certain role in how we apply these pruning methods. Why delete-free uh, planning? Well, first of all, because it's easier. It's not written on the slide, but it's easier to work with delete-free problems. But there are uh, naturally delete-free planning problems that are hard to solve by standard planning techniques. And our hope is that new methods for uh, delete-free planning can either lead to better delete-free heuristics or can propagate, the ideas can propagate to regular planning problems and inspire new techniques. So the main contribution of this paper is uh, new pruning methods that enhance the coverage of state-of-the-art algorithm when applied to delete-free problems. Some new ideas on landmark ordering and commitment to sub-goals. And an interesting exploitation of uh, what's known as the causal or the relaxed and or graph of the problem. So I'm going to start with a short overview of the method. Not everything will be clear when I describe it now, but then I'm going to go into more details and I think uh, eventually you'll see the ideas are, the essence of the ideas is quite uh, simple and I hope you'll all understand them and feel free to um, and ask me about them. So, First of all, in the pre-processing step, we find fact and action landmark using existing algorithms. The next step is to order them. And then we do a certain uh, uh, routine of propagating information, which I'm going to ex explain later. Uh, once we're in a particular state space, a, a state in a search space, then we apply any applicable action landmark immediately, and if none exist, we build the relaxed causal graph, which I'm going to describe soon, uh, for the current state and the goal. We find the closest landmark to the current state that is uh, not yet achieved, and we compute dis an applicable disjunctive action landmark, that is a disjunctive action landmark, all of whose actions are currently applicable. <coughs> we minimize this disjunctive action landmark, and then we use another process where we filter this uh, set of actions in this disjunctive action landmark based on what we call path commitment information. Intuitively, it's a commitment to a particular, to the, to particular path that attain uh, the landmark. Then this is basically the set of actions we expand the state with. So let me describe the relaxed uh, causal and or graph. Uh, so this is a structure described earlier by Kaler, Richter, and Helmert. It's a basically a depiction, a graphical depiction of the planning problem. 
and in the case of delete-free problem, it's an, it, it has all the information about it. So it's a uh, graph with n and or, it's an end or graph. Um, it has a single initial node that corresponds to the initial state and a special goal end node and a special end goal end a and D node with that and that achieves an N node T. So you can see it over here. The end nodes in the graph correspond to the action. There are the squares in gray. The OR nodes correspond to the variables. There are the circles in white. And an action's parents are basically its precondition. An action's children are its effect. And similarly, uh, okay, uh, so you can see here a few examples, but I think the idea is very simple. So the precondition of A are all the, uh, of an action are all the incoming, the, the nodes that have incoming edges into it, and the add of A are all the nodes that have an outgoing edge from uh, A to them. Um, similarly, we, we can talk about the achievers of a uh, proposition of an OR node and the consumers of an OR node. So these are all uh, standard terms. This is a simple, this is a simple, in the example I use a very simple graph where you don't really see that the end nodes are end nodes because they don't have multiple outgoing edges or incoming edges, but that's, but they, in, in principle they can. So um, we can also uh, have a notion of a relaxed plan or map the notion of a relaxed plan into this graph. It's uh, basically a subgraph of the uh, relaxed causal graph that justifies the goal set. So what does it mean? It includes the start and the uh, end node. And if it includes an N, N well, and an N, it's the, f the start and the last node. And if it includes an N node, then it includes all its preconditions, all its add nodes. And if it includes an OR node, then it includes at least one achiever. So you can see an example here of a justification subgraph which corresponds to a relaxed plan, or if we are working in delete-free planning, this is a plan for the goal. Okay, so let me remind everyone, I know everyone knows that a fact landmark for a state is a fact that holds at some point in every legal plan for the state. If you think about it in terms of the graph, then a fact landmark is an OR node that is part of every justification subgraph from the start node to the target node. It's saying exactly the same thing. An action landmark for a state is an action must be part of any plan, and a disjunctive action landmark for a state is a set of actions, at least one of which appear in any plan from the start node to the goal. So that means that in the relaxed causal graph, a disjunctive action landmark is a set of action such that if you remove it from the graph, there is no longer a justification subgraph that includes the last node T. Now here are a few facts about delete-free planning, uh, very easy to see. And I'll use L sub I to denote the set of fact landmarks for the initial state and L sub S the set of fact landmarks for state S. Um, so first proposition achieved remain true forever because there are no deletes. Applicable actions therefore is all, all always remain applicable since the preconditions will remain true. So this means that the order uh, of actions in a plan doesn't really matter as long as it's a valid plan because all of that you need to make sure is that you apply an action when it's preconditioned uh, hold and the effect of the action, no matter how you order it, would then be the same. It also means that we can immediately apply any applicable action landmark because we said that the order doesn't matter as long as things are applicable. So if you have an action landmark, you can immediately apply it. And for any state S that you reach from the initial state, its set of landmarks is a subset of the set of landmarks of the initial state. And the landmarks that have been, and the difference between them are exactly the landmarks that have been achieved en route to this state S. So 
We're going to focus on minimal plans. So a plan for the goal is minimal if no strict subset of the plan uh, uh, is a plan for the goal. We can focus on minimal um, plans because uh, every optimal plan is either minimal or has a subplan, uh, an, uh, an optimal subplan, which is minimal in case there are zero cost actions. So here's where decomposition comes in. Suppose you have a set of fact landmarks for a delete-free planning problem that includes the goal propositions as well. Then there exists an ordering of this set of landmarks such that in, essentially you can plan for each one of them. So you can plan for, L, for the first landmark and then from the state you reach plan for the second landmark and then from the state you reach plan for the third and so forth. And if in each of these if each of these subplans is minimal for the landmark you've just, uh, you're just pursuing, then the entire plan is minimal. So what corollary one is basically saying is essentially what you can do is you can find some landmark, plan for it, and go on from that point on. So instead of planning for the goal, we can plan for some landmark L and maintain minimality. Why do I care about maintaining minimality if I know that I explore all permutation, uh, one permutation at least of every minimal path, then I know that I'm going to maintain optimality. I'm going to find an optimal solution. So the first step is to obtain a set of uh, landmarks and then order them. And the ordering routine is very simple. We, generate, we uh, generate the graph of strongly connected components from the relaxed causal graph. That's an acyclic graph. And so we can sort the landmarks based on the uh, strongly connected components, the, uh, the ordering of the strongly connected components using any topological ordering. And if you have a number of landmarks within a certain uh, component, then you could do a sort of a breadth first search for hypergraphs that uh, orders them. So here's a simple example. So you have the relaxed causal graph on the left. And on the right you have, and you see two landmarks, L1 and L2. And on the right you have the graph of strongly connected components and you see that L1 is going to be ordered before L2. Okay, so now we've sorted the landmarks, and now we're going to try to use this in order to find a disjunctive action landmark and that of applicable actions, and that's going to be used for the pruning. So we can focus on action with an applicable disjunctive action landmark, pruning all other actions. And by focusing, and this is important, very important in practice, by focusing on the closest landmark uh, rather than on the goal or some arbitrary landmark when trying to generate this disjunctive action landmark, we're going to get smaller disjunctive action landmarks. Because as you'll see what we're going to do, we're going to backward chain from the landmark to the initial state. As if we backward chain from something that's very close to the initial state, we're going to uh, catch along the way fewer actions. So, um, if you look at L1, you can see, it's pretty intuitive, that A1 and A2 is an applicable disjunctive action landmark for L1. And therefore, if you are aware of this fact, then you can prune the action A3 at this uh, state S. So the algorithm works as follows. Um, it takes the relaxed causal graph for the current state and the fact landmark that we've chosen. Basically, the one is first in our ordering. And we move backward from this uh, landmark, collecting action in a backward chaining manner. The set of actions which is being built represents a subgraph of this relaxed causal graph that contains all the minimal justification subgraphs that contain or reach the landmark L. And therefore, the applicable action in the subgraph composed of disjunctive action landmark. So this is basically, these two points are basically the justification for the routine, but the routine itself is simple. Just go backward from this uh, disjunctive action landmark. 
And as I said, focusing on the closest landmark versus a goal or an arbitrary landmark considerably reduces the size of the disjunctive action landmark you obtain. So I'm not going to over pseudocode. You have that in the paper. Um, now, the applicable action, disjunctive action landmark we obtain may not be minimal. And then we go through a pretty uh, simple routine of trying to remove actions from it iteratively by basically going over the set of actions, removing one action, and seeing if we still have a disjunctive action landmark. We can do this by uh, checking the graph, whether we still have a justification graph or we don't have a justification graph without this action. Sometimes this can be uh, an expensive uh, uh, process, and in the domains where we do uh, not as well, that's usually the reason. Okay. So that's basically the first component of our pruning, the idea of finding a close, a nearby landmark, and going backwards in order to design a disjunctive action landmark. The second part is what we call a disjoint path commitment. So here's the intuition. During a, a star search, if there's, there are only two disjoint paths that uh, reach some landmark, then each optimal plan is going to contain actions only from one of these paths. So, uh, but during the search, after you execute one action, and this is related a little bit to the example that Martin gave, after you execute one action, then actions from the uh, applicable, actions that were applicable before from the other path will remain applicable. So, in principle, you can branch on them. But there's no need to consider them because you're not going to have a minimal plan that contains action from this branch and from the other branch as well. You only are going to have minimal plans that go along one of the branches alone. So if we are able to recognize the fact that a certain action cannot be part of a minimal path with the actions we are now using, then we can do farther pruning. So. In this example here, um, you see a graph, this, the, the relaxed causal graph for the state S and the landmark L. And on the right-hand side, you see the same subgraph after executing the action A2. Now, intuitively, you see that there are really three paths here that are leading to this landmark. And but after you executed, so after you executed A2, then really what you want to look is at A6, because there's, no there's not going to be a minimal plan that contains A2 and A1, or A2 and A3. These are redundant. But if in state S, both A1 and A3 are uh, applicable. So you need to somehow recognize the fact that A1 and A3 do not belong in a minimal plan that includes the action you've just executed, A2. Okay, so this is basically what's uh, said here below. So simplifying this theorem a little bit. So suppose that A last is the last action that you've taken to reach the current state S while pursuing some landmark L we can safely prune actions that are not included in any minimal plan that contains this last action uh, and lead to the fact landmark. Uh, some, there's some, uh, of course, refinements, but this is a basic idea. Now, of course, doing this explicitly is not going to work because the number of minimal plans can be exponential. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to approximate this. So we somehow need to recognize to which minimal plans does each action belong? And the way we're going to do this is we're going to look at the actions that achieve the landmark. We're going to use the actions that achieve the landmark as markers for different minimal plans. And it, I think it will be clear if you look at the example. In this example, you see here, you have three actions that achieve the landmark, A5, A6, and A7. Um, you wouldn't want any two of them in, uh, in any of your minimal plans. They will not appear in a minimal plan. So what we're going to do is we're going to basically use them as labels for minimal plans. Intuitively, the minimal plan that contains A5, the minimal plan that contains A6, and the minimal plan that contains A7. It's, it's going to be an approximation, but a sound one. 
So we're going to propagate backwards from these action and label action that we reach by propagating backwards by these actions. So other actions we see on the, on, on the way back by these actions. So uh, we use here a mu prime as the label. And you see that if you propagate backwards, the set of tags you get for A1 is going to be A5 and A6 because there's a, what ba a path back from A5 to A1 and from A6 to A1. For A2, you only have um, A6. And for A3, you ha only have A7. And what we're going to do is suppose we applied an action A last and we're considering applying an action A. If the set of tags associated with A is disjoint from the set of tag associated with A last, then we're going to prune this action. Why? Because this means that they cannot be on the same minimal plan. So if you look at the example here, then uh, A last here on the graph on the right is A2. This is the action we just performed. Now, if we, want, we consider A1, A1 has labels A5 and A6, and A2 has label A6, so we cannot prune A1. But A3 has label A7, and that's disjoint from the label of the action we just performed, A2, and therefore they cannot be part of the same minimal plan. So we can prune um, A, uh, so we can prune A3. A3. So now I'm going to back, back, I'm going back to the slide that I showed initially. I hope now you understand how things work. We find an a, 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 a fact and action landmarks. We order them. We do this propagation of uh, disjoint actions based on the actions that achieve the, the landmarks. And then at each uh, state along the search, we apply the following procedure, we build the relaxed color graph, we do the backward, we, we, we uh, find the closest landmark, we do this backward chaining to find a disjunctive action landmark, we minimize it, we minimize it further using the disjoint path information, and that gives us the, la the final set of actions that we're going to apply in this state. So, empirical results. So we've tested this with different time limits. Um, <clears throat> so for five minutes, you can see here basically is that pruning and blind is better than no pruning. So we compare here pruning with, uh, a bl without any heuristic information and pruning and no pruning with different heuristics. So you can see that pruning and blind is better than no pruning and merge and shrink, for instance, for almost every domain except free cell. You see that pruning and merge and shrink is better than both, uh, except again for free cell. Uh, pruning with LM cut is better than no pruning with LM cut, except for free cell and in grippers they perform similarly. And pruning in LM cut generally performs better than any of the other methods. Um, <clears throat> this is for 30 minutes. Uh, what you see here are uh, scores based on the scoring method of uh, Roger and Helmert. Higher values are better and 100 is highest. Um, in general, you see that pruning in LM cut solves uh, more problems and gets higher scores, but this is not, not always the case. Certain cases, you get better scores with, uh, without pruning. And the reason is, is this, uh, basically this routine where in some cases, we, the routine that generates the initial disjunctive action landmarks generate a pretty large disjunctive action landmark. And this routine where we try to repeatedly minimize it by taking out action doesn't do anything but takes a lot of time. So, um, following up on what I just said, one of the things we like to look at is if we can do the minimization step more efficiently or recognize cases where we shouldn't uh, try to do it at all. And we, cons we analyze the, the causal graph only once initially when we do the landmark generation and landmark ordering. If we were to do it at each state space or occasionally, we might get more up-to-date information during the search. And of course, what's most interesting is to try to extend these ideas to general planning. 
So some of ideas like finding good disjunctive action landmarks can probably be used in regular planning. For instance, there is this pruning method called SAC. And uh, the idea of this joint path, I think, may be generalizable to regular planning. That's it. Thank you. So that, that's uh, an interesting question for which I do not have a good answer. So we've tried to figure out. It seems that, I mean, this, multi, this multi-agent A-star basically has a, now an equivalent method. And I, I can uh, sort of uh, suggest people interested in, who, who are interested in pruning, there's an ECI paper. It's, it's basically a partitioning-based method. It's a method that partitions a set of actions and using that is able to prune uh, things. It does not seem to be equivalent to any of the current methods. And I mean, everything, you know, when you look at all of these methods, the intuitions to many of the things seem very, very close. But in, in the cases we've looked at, we haven't been able to, to get results, say, like Martin and Malte have. So, uh, you know, they look intuitively, there's a relationship. What it is, I don't know. What is uh, your ad deletes? Have you started looking at it? Uh, is there is something that carries over? We're, we're we, I, I don't have any concrete results to, to tell you about, but what we're focusing on is extending this idea of this joint path to, uh, to uh, problem with delete. 